Fourth and fifth graders, you guys are dismissed to Kids Church. If you have your Bible with you, we're in Acts chapter 2 this morning. Y'all are juiced up this morning. I like it. Must be the name tags. I think, I think that's it. If we'll, we'll do this again, but my, uh, next time we'll get extra large ones so that y'all can write bigger because I'm having a hard time reading them anyway. Uh, but no, thanks for, for jumping in on that this morning. I, I've heard lots of, of great comments from people, just how they've connected today. So I really appreciate that. And really before we get going, can we just celebrate what happened at Celebrate Recovery again one more time? Look, they had, they had almost 50 people there Tuesday night. And what we are praying for as a church, what we want God to do in our county is exactly what we saw in that video. I mean, we need to celebrate the fact that the Holy Spirit can deliver somebody from meth addiction, right? That, that that's not, that's something that only God can do. And, and we're seeing it happen in our midst. And so my hope is, is that what we are praying for is that we will see that happen on Sunday mornings, not just on Tuesday nights, but man, that ministry on Tuesday nights, th that is doing something and they need help. So if you're looking for a place to plug in, just let me know and I will get you connected with them, okay? But man, we need to be, we need to be celebrating the life change that only happens from the Holy Spirit because that's what we're celebrating this morning in Acts chapter two. The Holy Spirit comes and lives are changed. And what we are asking is that the Holy Spirit would come in such a way that lives would just be dramatically changed in our county. And I was talking to some people before the service today, and this is, this is new territory for me. I, I believe, I 100% believe that we have the power of the Holy Spirit living in us right now. And I also believe that God is about to do something new and that he hadn't done it yet and that we're waiting on it. And so I'm in this already not yet, which is exactly, I can identify this morning with the disciples. Remember last week we left them waiting, right? They had been promised the Holy Spirit, but they were waiting on him to come. So Acts 2 says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Pentecost literally means 50 days. And so it had been 50 days since Passover, which means that they had been waiting for 10 days since we left them last week. 10 days of prayer, 10 days of obedience. Now, in the grand scheme of things, we go, 10 days doesn't sound like a long time. 10 days is a long time to wait, right? I mean, anybody waiting for a doctor or to return your phone call knows that 10 days is a long time to wait. When you're expectant, when you're nervous, when you're scared, when you're not sure what's about to happen, 10 days is agonizing. 10 days of waiting for this promise that had not yet come. Now, the Feast of Pentecost is also called the Feast of Weeks. If you wanna know more about it, it's in Leviticus 23, but it's a, it's a feast celebrating the wheat harvest. So they would bring the very first fruits of the wheat harvest to Jerusalem and they would offer them to God. So it was a celebration of what God had already provided, looking toward what God would do next. That is not a coincidence. They were celebrating that the harvest had come and that God would provide it again next season. And so here they are, and, and Jerusalem is full because of the feast, this is the best attended one because the weather was pretty and travel was easy. And so Jerusalem's hopping, okay? There's people everywhere celebrating the provision of God and looking toward what he's going to do next. And they were all together still in one place. We left them there last week, right? They were all together. They were praying they were being obedient to God. They were waiting on the Holy Spirit, doing, again, doing what they were told to do when suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. This word is, is interesting to me, the suddenly. They were completely expecting God to do something and it still caught them by surprise when it happened. It is how we feel about the second coming of Jesus, right? 
we know he's coming back. We know that he's coming. We know that he's going to appear in the clouds. We know there's going to be the trumpet. There's going to be the angels. Like we know so much about that. But when it happens, it's going to take everybody by surprise. Even though we know it's coming. And so that's them, right? They are praying for the thing that is about to happen. And even when it happens, it caught them by surprise. Don't be surprised and be surprised when the Holy Spirit begins to move in our church in a mighty way. We're praying for it. We're seeking it. We're asking for it. And I still believe that when it happens, we're all gonna go, where'd that come from? Because that's how we're wired. That's how they were wired. So it was sudden. It it came without warning, although they were warned. And it was like the sound of a violent wind. So there was no wind, but it sounded like there was a tornado. Now, I've never been particularly close to a tornado, but I understand the sound is distinctive. This is a distinctive sound. So it sounded like the house was coming apart, even though there was no wind. It came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Fire is very symbolic in the Old Testament. Fire is purification. We are refined by fire. So the things that survive the fire are good things. They are things of great value. Also, fire is a symbol for the presence of God. Uh, Remember the Israelites followed the pillar of fire and their various moments, uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, the presence of God came by fire. And so these tongues of fire separated and rested, came to rest on each of them. Uh, Literally in the Greek, the word is sat. And again, I've, I've told you, the Greek's a beautiful language. I don't know very much of it at all, but it's a beautiful language because the words can can give us more information. And the verb there implies the force of completed preparation and that there was permanence in what happened. So when it says it sat on them and you're reading that in the Greek, it's like it said, and what they were being prepared for happened and it was going to stay with them forever. Those are the tongues of fire. And in that moment, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, filled to overflowing, as we've been talking about, with the Holy Spirit. Now, the rushing wind sound, temporary. The tongues of fire, temporary. The ability to speak other languages as they were enabled, temporary. But the Holy Spirit, permanent. The signs of the Spirit were temporary. But the presence of the Spirit was permanent. Why were they filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit? We talked about it last week. So that they would be his witnesses. Jesus said that the early church would have the power of the Holy Spirit. And then because of the Holy Spirit, they would be his witnesses. Remember, we talked last week that it's not a command It was an indicator. We will be his witnesses when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what plays out. That's the rest of the Old Testament. I mean, the New Testament, right? That's the rest of the story of the early church that we're gonna be looking at in Acts. The Holy Spirit comes and then they are his witnesses. And I believe that one of the problems that our church has and that the modern church has is that we're trying really hard to be his witnesses, but we're not relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. David Platt said this in his book, Radical. He said, we are a part of a system, that is the church, that has created a whole host of means and methods, plans and strategies for doing church that require little, if any, power of the Holy Spirit. That is amazingly on target and awfully convicting. The church has become an organization that makes plans on being his witness when all we really need to do is be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Because it's promised that we will be his witnesses. And we don't even know how he's going to do that. In their case, they began to speak in other tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there are, there are good Bible teachers who disagree on what happened here. Okay? In fact, I have two Bible sources that I use every week and they disagree. All right? I think they're both great and they completely have opposite interpretations. I would say the majority of interpretations here is that what they spoke in Acts 2 and also in Acts 10 and 19 were literal languages of the world, okay? So in, in our case, they would start speaking German and Spanish and French and, and all of those things, right? There are some commentators who believe that the, lang- the tongues they spoke are the same tongues that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, where he talks about if it is not a, it's not an earthly language and that uh, there is an interpreter and things of that nature. And so those commentators would say that these tongues were not what the disciples spoke was not a real language, but what people heard was their real language. Good people disagree on that, okay? I, I tend to go more toward that they spoke earthly languages and that it's different. But again, if, if you think the other way, then we'll laugh about it when we get to heaven when we don't care anymore, okay? Like nobody's losing their salvation over what the languages and tongues were, okay? So I, we don't exactly 100% know, okay? But I'm gonna go this morning with the idea that they, were, that they were languages because to me, it makes the most sense in context. Now, where they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation, there were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. So like I said, Jerusalem was full Mostly Jewish audience, mostly pilgrims for the feast, religious, devout, seeking God. So these were people that wanted to know God. And they heard the sound. And again, we're not 100% sure. Did they hear the sound like a rushing wind? Did they hear the sound of 100 and something people speaking languages? We don't know, but it drew a crowd. And they came together in bewilderment. Literally, they were stirred up because each one heard their own language being spoken. And they said, utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these people who are speaking Galileans? Now, I tried to find a really good way to explain why they said this, but here's the best I've got. Basically, what they said here is, aren't these a bunch of hillbillies? (laughs) Galileans were country folk. They did not live in the cosmopolitan cities. They lived in the hills around the Sea of Galilee. And as country folk, and we'll just all call ourselves country folk this morning, as country folk are known to do, the Galileans took the language and they shortened a bunch of words. Right? I mean, as they were thinking about it, they were reckoning that they would, uh, you know, talk short. And so they, they tend to drop consonants on the end of words like thinking. Okay. And so the, the cosmopolitan people in the Jerusalem area looked down on them because their language was, well, they just ain't, they ain't talking right. And so when they say this, they're like, well, that's a bunch of edu- uneducated hillbillies. Right? Like, they ain't smart. Why are they, why are they able to do this? And again, it's just the cultural thing, right? We all know that, that people who talk like that are incredibly brilliant. But maybe the imagery still is that if you, if you speak a little country, you know. So they are, they know that these are not scholars, they're not professors, right? They're not even from a place where you would know these languages. They're just simple fishermen who live up in the hills. And they're like, 
these people should not be speaking languages. How is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthian, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. What did they hear being said? The wonders of God. They were very clear what they heard. It wasn't just that they spoke a different language. It was what they heard. The wonders of God. And because of that, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? When they heard the wonders of God, when they heard the Holy Spirit speaking their own language in a way that they could understand it, and they were amazed at what happened, they were moved to action. What do we do now? What does this mean? What do I do from here? Guys, that's an, that's an amazing thing to experience. The, the best things that I get to experience as a pastor is someone who is far from God, who comes to God and they're like, well, I know my life's different, but I have no idea what to do now. That is awesome. I, I've told this story before, but I'm gonna tell it again this morning that uh, years ago when we were at Bear Creek, we built a building, we, we rented space for our first five years and then we built a building right across the street. It was an amazing thing to see God do. And the Sunday before we moved into our new building, we left church, all drove across the street and and we were gonna pray for the opening of the new building. Well, it just so happened that there was a brand new person there, uh, a guy that seemed a little rough around the edges, you know, and, and anyway, as we move from the church to the new church, he comes up to me before we can pray and he goes, dude, I need Jesus. And so I pull him aside and we, we talk about it and I bring him back over to the group. I'm like, guys, we came over here to pray over this church that God would use it for his glory, for his kingdom and draw people to him. And before we've ever opened the doors, a, a guy just accepted Christ right here on the doorstep. And so instead, we put him in the middle and we all prayed over him. And at the end, when I said, amen, he jumps up and he yells, this is blanking awesome. (laughs) And I'll just let you, let your imagination run. And I have never heard someone cuss so loudly at a church event that was received with applause. (laughs) It's the only words he knew, right? I mean, we got to witness the old self disappearing into the new self in a sentence. And he looked at me, he goes, what do I do now? And yeah, (laughs) I did not say, well, first let's talk about your language. Uh, Again, why do we expect lost people to act saved, right? We shouldn't. And why should we expect someone that's like that? It was beautiful. Because it was a spontaneous expression of the gospel changing his life. And I thought about that story every time I read that sentence this week about those people looking at the typo and going, what do we do now? Like they could have been just amazed that they were hearing the languages. But what they were amazed at were the wonders of God. And the wonders of God changed their lives. Well, most of them. Because there was another group who made fun of them and said, well, they've had too much wine. They're drunk. Now, I, I, don't, I, I don't know a lot of drunk people. People don't tend to want to be drunk around me. <laughs> but the times that I have, I have never seen someone so drunk that they began to educatedly speak another language. <laughs> From what I understand, you can't speak your own language. So that to me is a weird one, right? Well, here's what they're doing. They can't explain it, so they'll explain it, right? Now, did them saying that make it any less miraculous? No. Does them saying that make it any less truthful? No. 
why are we so surprised that the world tries to explain away the gospel just because they haven't understood it yet? Goodness, I waste more time in my head writing angry responses on social media. I, I, at least I don't write them, but I want to write like this to people that I don't even know who are misrepresenting the gospel, right? It makes us so mad when people misrepresent the gospel and we should stand for truth and we should speak it when we can. But you know what? It doesn't mean that the gospel isn't true. And these people saying those guys are drunk doesn't make it true. God just didn't open their ears to hear it. I've been studying 2 Thessalonians the last couple of weeks and I'm in a really difficult part where it talks about the man of lawlessness coming and the world turning into wickedness and the peep God sending chaos and discord among on the world because the people are so rebellious and there's a, there are people that are not gonna be able to hear the truth, but that doesn't mean that it's not true. And so then Peter stood up. Peter, who 53-ish days earlier denied that he knew Jesus because he was afraid. 53 days earlier, people were misrepresenting who Jesus was and what he did, and he ran and hid and denied that he even knew his name. And now 53 days later, <coughs> excuse me, 53 days later, unprompted, not forced, not asked, he stands up as a representative of the disciples and gives a very eloquent response that was completely unprepared. Now, Y'all know Peter, right? Peter who suffers from foot and mouth disease. Peter who would rather cut somebody's ear off than have a conversation. That is the same Peter that now stands up with no warning. He didn't have a week to write a sermon. With no warning begins to preach. He was completely surprised and also well-prepared. He was prepared and ready, which is different things, right? Because he had been walking with Jesus. And those, over those 50 days, Jesus had done a lot in his life. And he'd spent the last 10 days praying for an opportunity just like this. And even though it was completely spontaneous, he was ready. I think there's a lot of challenge right there for us that we need to be prepared for the things that we can't be prepared for. We need to be ready to respond whenever the Holy Spirit gives us this opportunity. And <coughs> he's not brash, he's not in a hurry. It's, it's none of who he used to be, it's the Holy Spirit. He says, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Uh, the, the imagery there is don't let my words fall on deaf ears. He says, these people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. The reason that he says it's only nine in the morning is that it was Jewish custom not to eat or drink before nine because it helped you stay inside the law. So it was more tradition than law, but most Jews didn't eat anything or drink anything until 9 a.m. And so he's referencing that again. He's like, not only are we not drunk, but none of us have eaten or, drinking any, or had anything to drink yet, right? He's like, it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what is spoken by the prophet Joel. What I love that he does here, he's like, so let's open our Bibles together, right? Let's, let's open the Old Testament. Well, at that time, just Testament. Let's, let's open the Testament, Right? Let's go back to what God has already said that you believe. In the last days, God says, I will pour my spirit out on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. 
I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He says, what you're witnessing is the promise of God. The spirit is being poured out for this purpose. And we'll pick up here next week where he talks about what it means to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. But he already makes the connection before he tells the story. The reason the Holy Spirit is poured out on the people is to be his witness so that anyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I'm gonna tell you as a pastor in 2023, it is difficult for me to take a passage like this and say, well, here's what we do now. Because I, I've never, in, in 20 something years of being a pastor, I've never had a experience. I, I, I know people who have, but I've never had an experience where God literally shook walls or sent tongues of fire. I have seen things that only he can do. I have been a part of things that I would only describe to you as miraculous. But I have, I have never had a physical uh, manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the way they did in Acts chapter two. Now, I believe God could do that if he wanted to. I, I believe that God could shake these walls. I believe he could send tongues of fire. I, I'm open to whatever God wants to do. But I know this, the same spirit that he gave to the disciples in Acts chapter two is the same spirit that lives in every believer. And I believe that spirit is in us now, but I also believe that there is something coming around the corner. And I can't explain it. I can't tell you what it is. I can't tell you what it's gonna look like. But I, as I, I have said over these last couple of weeks, I believe that God is about to move in this church in a fresh new way. And I think it's going to take us by surprise even though we're asking for it. And I think it's something that when we see it, we will know it. And at the same time, we'll be amazed by it. I believe that day is coming. And what I believe it's going to enable us to do is to speak the languages of Polk County. And most of that is English, right? What I'm talking about is the language of meth addiction and the language of alcoholism and the language of homes that are not safe and the language of poverty and the language of whatever else that we see around us that is not of God. I believe that God is going to enable his church to be his witnesses. And I believe that we are going to be able to go places and to reach people that up till now we would have said, we just don't speak their language. How would I ever Share the gospel with someone who's fill in the blank because I just don't understand that world. I just don't speak the language. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit translates for us. I believe that one of the outpourings of the Holy Spirit on First Baptist Church Livingston will be that people will hear the wonders of God, be amazed and ask the question, what do we do now? That's what I'm praying for. I don't know that it will look exactly like the church in Acts chapter two, but I think we can be prepared for it. And I think we can get ready, which is two different things. And some people will not understand what's about to happen. And they may make fun of us and they may mock us and they may say we're drunk. Let them talk. Because we're gonna preach Jesus. And it's the truth. No matter what happens, it's the truth.